thank you, Professor Link, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the company, because of the company as well as the uh, terrain and the accommodations and all that. Uh, my title really should be Autonomy of Art. I thought uh, autonomy in the plural sounded jazzier, so I uh, made it. And I thought maybe we could possibly, the autonomy of art could possibly be construed as plural. Haven't thought about it some more, I'm not so sure. Uh, uh, art and life, art and life as lived, can be seen as one and inseparable only when art is experienced sheerly as a phenomenon among other phenomena. Art experienced as art, art experienced aesthetically, properly quotes, art experienced at what's called aesthetic distance is not a phenomenon. What else it is, then, I can't say. And I can't say because art can't be defined or has never been satisfactorily defined. Aesthetic distance means separation, a kind of transcendence, if you please. And that word transcendence has gotten so fashionable that uh, I, uh, uh, I use it almost apologetically. Art as art takes place away from life as lived, is experienced as other than the to use Professor Cuspitz's phrase, life world, other than the life world. And this otherness is part of art's gift. The determining ultimate intention, end of art, of the aesthetic in general, is qualitative. The only and the final question for art is whether it's good or bad, and how good or bad. And this is decided according to a scale of values, or value, rather, decided by taste. And taste has to do only and exclusively with the aesthetic with aesthetic value, and aesthetic value is ultimately created by taste. The only legitimate demand that can be put to art is that it be good, aesthetically satisfying, and this demand can be made only by taste. The aesthetic happens to be among the final satisfactions of life as lived, an ultimate satisfaction of value in itself and not a means, not an instrument to an end beyond itself. But being an ultimate end doesn't mean being a supreme one. Life as lived, happiness in life as lived, life in the life world uh, happens to stand higher. By the same token, though, Morality becomes a means, a means to happiness. Morality is not an end in itself. In spite of Kant's categorical imperative, happiness is an end in itself. 
And I would agree with Kant that in order to be happy, you have to be a moral being and live morally. But still, morality is not an end in itself, it's a means. Unlike the aesthetic, which serves only itself, and the kind of distance satisfaction or happiness it provides and which isn't the same this distance happiness as the supreme happiness that can be found only in life as lived aesthetic satisfaction aesthetic felicity is too distant Now, art converts everything specifiable, identifiable, into means. And that includes morality. Just as morality is a means in lived life, so it's a means in art. But unlike almost everything else, morality is not a flexible means for art or in art. Literature shows that morality inside art won't lend itself with aesthetic profit to anything that makes it violate itself. A fiction celebrating cruelty will fail as art because it reaches aesthetic distance by offending too much in terms of life as lived. It breaks out, it breaks out of its sphere, art does, when it too flagrantly, when it shows, when it uses something that too flagrantly violates morality without correcting that. Art simply can't afford to do that. Uh, there may be exceptions, but I don't know of them. Now, the fact that morality is a means and that art or the aesthetic is an end, an ultimate value, again, doesn't mean that morality, the instrumental value, stands lower in the hierarchy of values than the aesthetic. Not at all. Life as lived has the say and has the final say. And it says that art is a value in itself possesses lesser value than morality as a means to value. Morality serves lived life and there's no higher court of appeal than lived life. Sure, art's a part of life, it embellishes life, it's one of the satisfactions of life, but it's still subordinate to other ends, even though it's not a means. It's subordinate, but not a means or an instrument. Having said this, having put, I hoped, because I hope, uh, having put art in its place, I want to give that place its due. And once again, of art, in its place, in its own place. All that can be asked is that it work, that it succeed, satisfy as art. It serves life as lived by serving itself. And when it serves itself satisfactorily, it stops all further demands or questions 
Now, an art has to observe certain limits, like the one point I pointed out with regard to morality, and maybe only that limit doesn't change this. And anyhow, it seems that it's literature alone that's had to observe this limit. Music and visual art and dance have been utterly unconstrained with respect to morality, or almost so. Dance, in so far as it tells the story, is not unconstrained in this respect. Oh, well, and let's say these three arts are, in a sense, utterly unconstrained. Try going into the moral sense or implications of a piece of music or a painting or a sculpture. There are pictures that celebrate, in effect, the sadism involved in depicting a martyrdom. There's Greenewald's crucifixion, it seemed to savor a certain gruesomeness. And yet, when the art is good enough, the sadism is obliterated, or to use that damn word again, transcended. And only the art is left. And this may be to the advantage of the, quote, purity, unquote, of visual art. And of music, too. The fact that it has no conceptual meanings. This may be the advantage of visual art and music as against literature with its, quote, impurity, unquote. But I really think that this distinction can go too far. The fact is that art of any kind, literature included, doesn't operate as a moral or any other kind of agent. It operates only for itself. And from what, for what and it operates only for what we can get from that self in abstraction from whatever else. But again, I have to be careful in what I say here. Culture is a civilizing force, and art is part of culture. Yes, yes, yes. But art does its civilizing best Art refines sensibility and expands sensibility most effectively when it's itself, when it serves itself. In the showdown, art is morally, politically, socially indifferent. Of course, this doesn't mean that art takes place in a vacuum. Art is influenced by everything, almost everything. Of course, life is lived, crowds in, and fills art. And art has to feed off life is lived. Of course, uh, uh, but there's a certain point where we have to do some abstracting again. The recognition of how much, of how indissoluble art is from life can be overdone. Uh, we've become able to appreciate art from all times and all places. That is, we've, been, we've become able to overcome historical circumstance in experiencing art. Maybe artists can't do that in making art. 
but the beholder seems to be able to do that and why he's been able to he's become increasingly able to do that in latter years is a sub topic all by itself uh, the catholicity of uh, taste in the west is a historical unicum it's unique as far as i know in history but let's leave that aside for the moment The fact is that hypothetically, in principle, the artist can largely transcend or abstract himself from every historical circumstance, except that of art itself. That is the tradition or course of the particular art he practices. Oh. This is, uh, this point is a little moot. I won't expand on it too much here, but I'd welcome questions afterwards uh, with regard to this. Artists can, at any rate, and have and do work in disregard more or, less, more or less of all the larger events and circumstances and conditions of that time. The larger ones, mind you. They can and have and do, in many cases, proceed in disregard of personal circumstances. But this generalization is a very approximate one. And I'd like to make it over again more cautiously. The artist or the, and the beholder too put their lived lives into their dealings with art. And yet at the same time transcend their lived lives. As he transcends himself, the artist, art, good or bad, will be affected by something of those general circumstances of his, something of the general cir circumstances of his time, but not necessarily or not evidently enough to make it useful to point that out. But what the artist's art will not escape revealing and I'm talking about the ambitious artist. I'm talking about the high artist. Though it's not this my point is not necessarily confined to the sophisticated artists, the artist will not <coughs> be able to escape revealing where artistic tradition has gotten to in his own time. He won't even be able to do so when he tries to counterfeit art of the past. He usually gets found out. Forgeries, fakes get uh, discovered uh, that will, you know again that's a, a generalization with uh, uh, that fades at the edges there are exceptions what I'm getting at in this way I hope isn't so roundabout is the fact that art and the history of art can be approached and discussed illuminatingly all by themselves. As taking place in an area of experience that's autonomous, 
that doesn't have to be connected with any other area of experience in order to have sense made of it. Now what I've just said is the, let's say the most radical expression I can think of, of what's called vulgarly formalism. And I want to go on to say that better sense can be made of art, more justice can be done, let's say, to the experience of art, the experience of art qua art, if it is dealt with as autonomous, as being abstracted from all political, social, economic, or religious, or moral issues or factors. That is, if art, so to speak, is dealt with in vacuo, in a vacuum. I know, and that's horrendous. We're not supposed to do that. Okay. All the while, we realize, of course, that art doesn't take place in a vacuum. But what I mean, and here I'm using some more fashionable jargon, that art can be best dealt with qua art by bracketing off. We heard that word bracketing off before. Uh, as the phenomenologists would say, bracketing art, bracketing art off in order to find out more about the experience of it. The experience in the experiencing and in the making of it. Well, actually, we do bracket off the history and practice of science and medicine and engineering and many other things in order to scrutinize them better. But as we try to scrutinize them in themselves, we do a kind of, oh, some more jargon, phenomenological reduction. Well, I do that kind of bracketing myself when, as a critic, I deal with art, and not only with recent art. When I started out, I used to bring in at least the temper of the times. And uh, I used to do a lot more interpreting than I do now. Uh, years ago, I stopped doing that. Uh, practice and experience instructed me here. I found out that for myself it was too facile to interpret in terms, art in terms of factors other than art. And cast, not, didn't cast enough light on either art or these other factors, except maybe incidentally. And I found out I was saying things that I was usually saying things that any intelligent reader already knew, like in saying that Matisse's Nice period reflected the post-1918 hedonism of France of Europe, Western Europe. You know, and then I had to ask myself, why didn't pre-1914 art reflect the even greater hedonism of the Belle Epoque of the 1900s, the 1890s? Then so I said, well, you know, and I'd get in to something that had to do with art only very indirectly. And I found out that with other people, this business of investigating how art reflected the temper of its times, with other people uh, it didn't help so much. Like, say, Lukács, 
has become rather well known over here. Lukács writing on the historical novel. Uh, now, I think uh, I've expressed, I've made certain points in too extreme a way, but uh, in order to emphasize them. And I want to qualify some of what I've just said. So assessing the temper of the times, our times are, or any past times of the past, is an interesting topic all by itself. And it can be a fruitful one all by itself. And sometimes art is part of the evidence for the temper of the times. But art is also tricky evidence for the temper of the times, and it often comes down to saying, post hoke, prompt a hoke. If something happened after this, then it was caused by this. Or if something happened at the same time as this, it had necessarily to do with this. And that was part of the facility with which art historical interpretation could be practiced. One example for me is uh, the case of abstract expressionism. Is abstract expressionism evidence for the temper of post-war America? Uh, I'd say not. Not as I experienced post-war, this country after the war. No, I'd say that uh, abstract expressionism was evidence of the temper of the times in the 30s, when the, all the artists concerned were younger. You know, and then I'd leave begin to surmise, well, maybe that is uh, how uh, life as lived uh, in, in general affects art, literature, and so forth, that it's what happens to you, what happened to you in your youth. And that's been said before, but without uh, furnishing enough evidence. I come back to morality. Moral statements are sometimes there and sometimes not there in the best art of the past. All the same, I repeat, and I want to say, winding up, I repeat that asking you to serve a moral or any other end except aesthetic quality is to make an illeg illegitimate demand on art. And the experience of art, the reported experience of art, the experience of art that's been acted on, the experience of art with its satisfactions and dissatisfactions shows that. Thank you.